Okay, uh, I'll get started. Uh, it's great pleasure to welcome Alessa Mintelli uh, here, our first out-of-state um, speaker we've had since February 2020. Uh, and actually, she is now at the University of Tasmania, so our first international speaker in this series to be here in person um, um, for a very long time. But um, so Elisa got her um, did her at education um, in the uh, Portoteca, Politica, uh, Torino, or is that okay? I murdered the pronunciation. Sorry there. But uh, and then uh, did postdocs at the University of British Columbia with Christian Schuff, um at University of Stanford with Jenny Sackdale and um, Dusty Schroeder and uh, most recently at Princeton with Olga Segarenko. And now she is an assistant professor at uh, University of Tasmania, though for obvious pandemic reasons, hasn't quite got there in person yet, which is why she's able to join us today. So with that, I'll let her get started. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I hope that everybody hears me and if you don't just say something, um, then, Many thanks for, for having me. Like, it's really such an honor to be here today. And uh, uh, this work that I'm presenting uh, is really something that I, I care deeply about and that I've spent the last few years working on. And uh, it's really an honor to be here today because some of the observations that really motivate this work come from work of people who are either in the room or associated with this institution. And so it's really a pleasure to be here. And um, before I start, let me just acknowledge those who have shared this journey with me. Um, so Marianne and Matteo uh, were students at the University of British Columbia and in Politecnico di Torino, um, and who shared pieces of this work with me. And then Luca uh, Ridolfi is an expert in stochastic processes whom I had the pleasure to work with back in Italy. And then Christian at the University of British Columbia, um, who uh, really, I co-authored the uh, latest pieces of this work with. And so now back in, into the, no, actually back, moving into the meat of this, this talk, well, let me just make a little premise that is I'm a fluid dynamicist by training. And so if I manage to move on, there we go. Uh, this is a bit the standpoint that we take here. And so forgive me if this is all known to you, but like from the perspective of fluid dynamics, what we're really looking at in terms of an ice sheet is just viscous gravity current that spreads under its own weight. And uh, how does this work is that you build up an ice sheet over thousands of years uh, due to accumulation in the, uh, at the center of the ice sheet. And then this thing spreads out uh, like a drop of honey on the substrate and it loses mass at, the, at its sides by either by melting at the surface or at the bottom of um, ice shelves uh, or by calving um, on its sides. And so this gradient, spatial gradients between where you put mass on your ice sheet and where you lose mass from your ice sheet is what sets the flow of the ice sheet. Now, I wish I could use my cursor to show you things on the screen, but I can't apparently, so uh, bear with me for that. Now, going, uh, so we set ice flow. Um, how does this ice flow works? Uh, there are two main, motion, two main types of motion uh, on the left. Uh, of the screen, you see uh, motion by creep or internal deformation where the ice doesn't, uh, the ice is in contact with the bed underneath and does not slide. Whereas on the right, different type of motion where the ice bed contact is lubricated, then um, the, the, the ice sheet slides. These two types of motion account for different sets of velocities. So you have velocities of the order of tens of meters per year, few tens of meters per year with creep and internal deformation only whereas you have much larger velocities uh, when you have sliding and much larger means up to kilometers per year. Now, um, and the reason why we're interested in the details of this ice flow is that really this is what conveys ice to the edges of the ice sheet and therefore uh, drives how much ice we lose to the ocean. So now this is just a simple cross section and, and just a cartoon. Now, how do things look like in practice? Now, this is, um, velocity field of a real ice sheet. This is Antarctica, it's remote sensing data. Um, surface velocity, you see the, uh, the scale on the top left. Orange means almost stagnant. Uh, blue, uh, purple is the fastest pieces of the ice sheet. And now this thing as an animation, and uh, the, the thing that I want you to see is that A, the first, uh, the flow is very far from being uniform, both in the interior and on the edges. And so you have structure all around. 
But most importantly, as you go close to the edges, you have these river-like features, uh, which you see in blue and purple. Uh, up there, you see one that is the Amory, and then you will see others on the left. And those are really what we care about. These are ice streams, like the Amory is not properly, uh, like up there, Lambert Glacier is not an ice stream, but uh, those down there on the right, like the Cypher Coast ones are what we really care about. Um, and, and these things drain the ice from the interior of the ice sheet to the, to the edges, and they flow at speeds that are orders of magnitude bigger than the rest of the remainder of the ice sheet. And so uh, really, um, if we care about predicting mass loss from an ice sheet, we should be caring about what ice streams do. Um, now, um, I showed you this high speeds. Next question is, well, do these high speeds, as we could intuitively expect, um, affect the mass balance of the ice sheet? This here on the right um, is, uh, is data from uh, remote sensing observations. Again, it's satellite altimetry data. And the color scale shows the rate of thickening and thinning of the ice sheet corrected already for uh, snow accumulation effects. And so what this is a proxy for is really um, gain if you see thickening and loss of mass if you see thinning driven by ice flow. The color scale is here at the bottom. Red means um, thinning, blue means thickening. And the thing that I want you to see here is that the places that are thinning and thickening the most is an ice stream uh, in the Cypol Coast that stagnated some 150 years ago, can buy streams. And places here uh, on the uh, Amundsen Sea sector on the west left side of the picture, um, like the Twaits Glacier and Pine Island Glacier, that are at least Twaits can be thought of as an ice stream, are currently active and accelerating ice streams. And so what, we, what this picture says is that if we want to extrapolate from here, uh, from present day mass loss and Antarctic state into the future, really we should care about what ice streams do because these ice streams can control the mass balance of an ice sheet. Now then why should that be so complicated? Can't we just say that these ice streams stay as will be in the future as they are today? And this brings me back to my opening line, fantastic piece, which you may have wondered about. Now what I'm going to show you here uh, on the right is a movie, it's work by Nick Gollage. Here, it's a reconstruction of ice flow from Antarctica for the last 25,000 years. You see the timestamp down there. Surface velocity color scale is the opposite of what we saw before. Blue means slow and orange means fast. And so now if we play this, what you see is this river-like features, which are pseudo ice streams that do all sorts of crazy things. They can appear spontaneously, they switch on and off, um, and they move around in space. And so, which is really what we refer to collectively as dynamics. And so this is the very reasons why we can't just say that ice streams that we observe today will be the same as they are in the future. Uh, as they are today, they will remain the same for the future. And really, really what we would want to be able to do is to have these dynamics in ice flow models that we use uh, to make projections of sea level rise. So, because in that way, then we can ask, start asking questions like, well, what happens if climate changes? Does the current distribution of ice streams remain the same? Does, do, they, do we get more of them? Do we get less? How much do they affect the mass balance of the ice sheet? Well, uh, this is easier said than done. Uh, here, what I'm, I'm showing on the right is results of a slightly outdated intercomparison exercise of different ice flow models. Every tile that you see here is one ice flow models and all of this, these models are supposed to represent the evolution of a circular ice, ice sheet with a um, weakness, uh, like something special in the boundary conditions on the right side of the tile that is supposed to create an ice stream. And the, the type of boundary conditions that this ice sheet, model, uh, ice sheet models use is the same. So, uh, the setup is the same, the initial condition is, is the same, and what you're seeing here uh, is the last time, time step of evolution uh, of this model, is the velocity field actually. What you want to see is that none of them looks the same. And now what this tells us is that the moment we try to produce ice streams in a prognostic way, actually we don't manage to get models to agree with each other. And what that means really is that Yes, we may have implementation issues, but also there are pieces of physics that we fundamentally don't understand of how these things work and how these ice streams are created. And this is really the motivation for the work that I'm presenting today. So what we're 
try, what I'm going to try and do is to break down these different types of dynamics that we observe of ice streams. We will look first at temporal dynamics, so ice streams switching on and off, and, and ask questions about what are the fundamental pieces of physics that we need to predict these behaviors. And then we're going to zoom out and look at more complicated problem of patterning. And so how do we get ice streams to show up spontaneously uh, in an ice sheet and take this pattern structure where they self-organize in space and they produce these regular patterns. Um, so that's, that's the overview of what we're gonna do. Now moving into, oh yeah, one thing that I forgot to say is that the first, uh, I will spend the next 10 minutes presenting some background information for on, on the, the oscillatory behavior of ice streams. This is work that has been done by others. Uh, lots of people worked on this. The, the, the line of thinking that I present here uh, comes mostly from Alex Robel's work most recently. Um, and so that gives us a very nice framework to then start asking more complicated questions later on. All right, so I cheated a little bit so far, and I just showed you a model, evidence from models of this ice stream dynamics, but actually there is observational or the observational direct and indirect evidence that these things can happen. Now here, uh, I'm going to show you two lines of evidence. One comes from the deep past on the left here is a record of like, actually it's a proxy for temperature over the last glacial time, um, comes from an ice core in Greenland. What this shows us, so this is interesting because it tells us that paleoclimate studies show that this paleoclimate over the last glacial period has experienced um, quasi-periodic oscillations during timescales of around thousands of years, which here are marked with these gray bars that you see and are marked with H there. And uh, these oscillations are linked to the discharge of and release of large amounts of fresh water in the North Atlantic, presumably from what used to be the North American ice sheet. And now there is uh, geomorphological evidence, which you see on the right, uh, which suggests that this uh, periodic behavior of the ice sheet actually arises from the activation of an ice stream in the Hudson Strait. Uh, and, and, and so this is really, uh, this really strongly suggests that ice sheets can oscillate and not just the whole ice sheet, but ice streams specifically over time scales of a few thousands of years. The other piece of evidence, uh, or at least piece of the puzzle, come from modern observations. And uh, this is work by Ale Brock and Ginny Catania. Uh, here on the left is the map that we saw before of thinning and thickening. And I'm zooming in in this um, green, uh, green box, which is represented on the right. And what you see on the right is velocities of this area that is known as the Cypel Coast. Now, the thing that I want you to see is that the blue, blue uh, region in the left image, uh, so the place that is thickening the most in Antarctica today, actually corresponds to the gap that is named labeled Camp Ice Stream on the right picture. And so what this is telling us is that in a place where an ice stream stagnates, so we know that Camp stagnated some 150 years ago, that is associated with geometric effects and thickening. And we can see that in the mass balance of the ice sheet. So that is the other, piece of the puzzle that we have. What this suggests altogether is that ice streams can oscillate. There is a geometric component to it. And now what we're gonna add to that is that there is a set of thermomechanical effects that actually causes this variability. So the, the, what we see at CAM is just one part of a cycle that could lead an ice stream from stagnation to activation and back to stagnation. Now, very simply in physics, how does this work? We're going back to cartoon world here. Um, so this would be an ice sheet flow line from a divide to the grounding line. And now let's think for a moment about the geometry of this thing. If this is in a steady state, the geometry that is the thickness of the ice surface is governed by a balance between snow, how much mass we put in, so snowfall, and how much mass we lose, that is melting. Um, and now if we change uh, this to or melting or mass loss, now, melting is not the only way in which uh, an ice sheet can lose or gain mass, like changes in ice flow can also change the geometry. And that is one thing that you should keep in mind. 
The second ingredient, though, is the thermal part of it. And so how does this work? We have three main elements to this. First of all, we supply heat from underneath via geothermal heat flux. Then our ice dissipates heat inside and at the interface between the ice and bed via uh, viscous dissipation and frictional dissipation. And then you lose ice to the surface. Uh, you, you lose uh, heat to the surface, pardon me. Um, by conduction or advection, the surface, the surface is cold. Here, let's think about uh, conduction only for simplicity. And now um, the, the interesting thing of this balance is that ultimately it uh, determines how warm the contact between the ice and the bed is. And so this, you can think of the sum of these three ingredients as telling you how um, really what's the temperature of the ice bed contact and or what is how much melt water can live there depending on whether we are above or below the melting point. And so you can start imagining that changes in the um, energy balance can modulate the strength of the bed underneath and therefore how uh, the ice moves and whether it can slide or, or not. And that changes the ice flux and that can change the geometry instead. Okay, so then the question that we ask is, let's start from a steady state configuration and make snowfall, for instance, a little bigger than what happens. Now we make snowfall bigger, our ice sheet wants to grow, right? Um, what does that do um, to the, uh, to the uh, energy balance of the, ice, of the ice sheet? Well, geothermal heat flux remains the same. Uh, we dissipate more heat and glacially because the ice is thicker and so we evacuate a larger flux. And so dissipation increases and we lose less heat to the surface because it's like the blanket that sits on, on the bed gets thicker. And so if the surface remains at the same temperature, then less heat makes it through, right? And so what that builds up to is that our bed wants to get warmer uh, as we make the ice sheet grow, everything else being the same. And this can weaken the bed and initiate sliding. And now if we initiate sliding though, what we're changing is the mass flux. So at the same thickness, we're evacuating more ice. And now that affects the geometry in, uh, in turn. And so our ice sheet wants to thin and uh, reduce its surface slope. But that again, this geometric effect affects, changes the, the energy budget. And now we have that we lose more heat to, due to, con to conduction to the surface because the ice is thinner uh, and we reduce dissipation because the, the flux evacuated is smaller. And that would want to lead the bed to uh, cooling down and we can switch off sliding and go back to uh, a smaller flow. Now, from here, where do we go? Well, um, if the, the mass loss, uh, from ice flow are less than the gain that we have from accumulation, then our ice sheet want to start grow again, growing again. And so we can end up in this cycle that never ends. So this is really the basic recipe to make an ice stream oscillate. And now if we want to look at this from the perspective of ice flow, and it's because really these oscillations are, like we said before, uh, an ice stream that switches on and so flows fast and then switches off, meaning it flow, it moves more slowly. And so how, how, how can we understand that then? Um, in the context of what I just described, you say, well, if we make flow a little faster, then what we're doing is increasing frictional dissipation at the iceberg contact, increase the melt rate, which would want to make the flow even faster. But then on the other hand, as we make the flow faster, we have this geometric effect where we reduce, uh, we increase cooling due to the thinning, and then that decreases the melt rate at the bed and it wants to reduce uh, the velocity of the flow. And so if these two feedbacks balance exactly, we could have an ice stream that flows at a steady state. But if these two feedbacks instead alternate in time, that is how we uh, make oscillations, right? All right, so then the question is, well, what, what happens? Like, do these things balance or do, this, do these two feedbacks actually alternate in time? And to answer this, we need to add one extra ingredient that is how are these feedbacks modulated by climate? And so to do this, forgive me for showing some math here, but uh, I'll just tell you what, what I want you to see in this. 
um, we're going to go to Alex's model, uh, which has two simple components. It's, it's a box model of an ice stream. The first equation that, that you see at the top is the mass balance of this thing. So we're modeling the evolution of the ice thickness, which is named H there. And the second equation is an evolution equation for the water content of the bed, which is a proxy for the strength of the bed. So the larger the water content, the, uh, the weaker the bed, the smaller the water content, the stronger the bed. So it's really that effect that we were talking about before. And now where does climate come in here? Two parameters. Uh, AC is the accumulation at the surface and TS is the, the temperature at the surface of the ice sheet. That uh, really modulates the advection, uh, this, uh, par pardon, the conduction term that we described before. So the smaller the temperature at the surface, the more heat we lose uh, to the surface and therefore the melt rate. And so what we're gonna do with this is to say, well, um, fix one of the two parameters, we're gonna fix the accumulation rate and change the other and see what, what solutions this model has. So now what I'm going to show here is on the left, uh, a picture of um, a plot of the uh, ice thickness uh, oscillation amplitude again atmospheric temperature against atmospheric temperature on the right axis uh, on the x axis pardon and on the right i'm going to show you time series of velocity of this ice stream against time and so like, if we start from the first red dot we are at low temperatures uh, what we see on the top right panel is the velocity of the center line and this ice stream oscillates uh, so it goes from high speed to low speed. So this is a, an ice stream that stagnates and where the velocity is zero and activates where you see those bumps, right? Now, if we make temperature a little warmer, these oscillations persist, change a little bit in amplitude, like they decrease in amplitude, change a little bit in periodicity, but nothing dramatic. And we can do so all the way to this temperature. Like, yes, there is a bit of a pattern, but nothing significant changes. But then if we increase temperature further, our solution is now that those two feedbacks that we we're talking about before balance and we produce an ice cream that is in a steady state. Interesting thing though is if we reverse the path here and now we make temperature, we go from, from here and make it colder again, actually we do not take the same path as we did before. Like we decrease, now we, we make temperature colder and and we keep this steady solution all the way to almost minus 30. And then we jump back up again to the other branch where we have oscillations. So this is a form of hysteresis and it's interesting because what it's telling us is that as we make an ice sheet, um, as we mm, basically push an ice stream away from its oscillatory state by making climate warmer, uh, we push it into a state where it's harder to get it back to these oscillations. And so now it's hard from this model to draw any conclusion about you lose more or less mass. But the thing that you should be aware of is that changing climate can change fundamentally the behavior of an ice cream in time. All right, this is a quick summary of this first part. Uh, the, the, the only thing that is important really here for the purpose of what comes later is to keep in mind that uh, there are different versions of this feedback that I have described here, and the differences can come in when we look at what are the mechanisms that strengthen or weaken the bed. There are many that have been proposed. It can be um, a plastic bed, it can be hydrology, it can be a th purely thermal feedback, doesn't matter. So long as you have something that can make the bed weaker or stronger, and that fits back into the flow, it all works in the same way. All right. Are there any questions before we move on. Yes. I have, a I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm just thinking about Greenland where the temperature oscillations are on much shorter time scales than you might experience in Antarctica. And we have seen individual glaciers that go through these oscillations. And I'm wondering if it might be related to the fact like then they do so on much shorter time scales than millennial. And so I'm wondering if it might be related to the oscillation. Yeah. Ginny, I am getting there in a second. Um, Perfect. So hold on, but the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, my question was, I saw you had a T melt term. So you're accounting for pressure melting as well. 
Yes, uh, in, a, in, in many ways, this is, it's almost unimportant here, actually, because the way in which it was set up mm -hmm. uh, this way is looking, we're looking at a plastic bed. And so all that have, so the bed never freezes really there. And so uh, you're always above the melting point and uh, the switch is between failure of a plastic sediment bed or not failing a plastic sediment bed. So that is what you're turning around. Gotcha. But yes, that will come in later. It's actually really important when you look at a 3D setting because like you, you can almost, you can prove that mathematically, like your ice cream is bound to freeze at some point. And what happens at this freezing transition uh, is actually very important. Awesome, thank you. All right, on to Ginny's question. Um, this explain this that we've shown gives us a sense for where variability along time scales come from. There are observations like this is work by Jeannie actually that tell us that I was thinking about the Cypol coast here, but Greenland also uh, does that. We have uh, so we know that these ice streams oscillate uh, in or anyway have significant experience significant changes over time at timescales are much shorter than millennia and sometimes are as short as decades or even less. Now, the model that we have described so far cannot explain this simply. Like the fact that there is this hysteresis poses a strong lower bound to the periodicity of those oscillations, which is somewhere around 800 years. So these behaviors cannot be explained like that. But like Jeannie suggested, um, we have forgotten one piece here that is, we have assumed for the model as it was before, that climate remains steady over uh, the uh, oscillation time scale of the ice, the ice stream. But that is actually not true. So now here I'm zooming in into uh, that, that atmospheric temperature record uh, from the last glacial maximum. And what I'm showing in the top, uh, in the bottom left panel is just the Holocene, so last 10,000 years. And you can see that even, the, even if the mean climate is essentially steady, there is a lot of variability in there. And now the question that we ask is, well, if we take this variability into account, then does that change anything in the picture of this, dynamic, this temporal variability of ice streams? And to do that, we go back to what we had before, same, same idea, but now this TS, uh, so surface temperature parameter, we, uh, rather than keeping it constant, we write it as we have here in the bottom right as a constant plus a noisy term, where the noisy term, its amplitude and covariance is estimated uh, from real world observations. And so it's realistic noise term. It's something that we have, ex like ice sheets have experienced over the last 10,000 years. And so what we're gonna do now is to say, well, let's take a, a case for which the ice stream would want naturally to live in a steady state. So one of those cases on the right of the plots that we're looking at before. And now keep in mind uh, what I said before about, there are two variables that describe the state of our ice stream. One is the ice thickness, which you see here plotted on the y-axis. You will see plotted on the y-axis. And the other is the bed water content uh, x-axis. So proxy for strength of the bed. Now the ice stream at any point in time the ice stream is, this, is described by these two variables. And so a point that you see on this plane identifies the state of the ice stream. And you will see that evolving and moving around as time goes. So now I'm going to show you two movies. On the left, we see the, the trajectory of an ice stream that experiences a steady climate. And on the right, an ice stream that experiences uh, a noisy climate, everything else being the same. And now what you see is that, so time is going. Uh, on the left, our ice stream has spiraled down to a fixed point and there it stays. That is our steady state. But on the right, everything else being the same and ju just adding noise, these things, this ice stream keeps going around between, yes, the fixed point here where you see the, the, the black lines and then taking these big excursions around. So it's a completely different behavior. Now, how do we understand this? Well, we can go back to the picture that we had before, um, thickness on the y-axis, atmospheric temperature on the x-axis, gray was the hysteresis region that we, we highlighted before. 
And now this, this cross marks the point where, which we're looking at. So that is the temperature that we're looking at. And the thing that is important to realize is that the amplitude of the noise, which is given by the, big arrow, uh, by the small arrow, is much smaller than the excursion in temperature that it would take to push our ice stream from the steady solution to the oscillating solution. So really what we're saying is, it's not that we're just kicking the system to this other state with the forcing, but the, the, the fact that there is noise and variability really modifies the, um, uh, the, the, the dynamical structure of the system and what are called the basins of attraction of our solutions so that our ice stream can experience those oscillations when it's forced with noise. We can go even a little further than this and, and ask the same question as we, we did before. That is, how do, does this uh, stochastically forced ice stream uh, behave as we change the mean temperature. And this is what I'm plotting now in the red with the red curve. Uh, so this is an average over time for each realization. And I'm keeping the, no the, the noisy term constant and changing the mean part of the temperature forcing. And, um, and, and what this shows us is that there is now a gradual change from this oscillatory solution on the left down to the steady state solution on the right. There is no longer that jump that we had before. And now if we look at time series, again, red being the noisy system and black being the, the system with steady atmospheric forcing, what this is really doing is saying, well, as we move, uh, as we change the, the mean temperature, our system, uh, our noisy ice stream, goes from spending most of the time close to the oscillatory solution to spending most of the time close to the steady state solution. But while it does so, we have also introduced this short amplitude, uh, so short variability, uh, short time scale, pardon me. It's not really a periodicity, but it's really short time scale oscillations. That is what we could not explain before. And so I guess this answers Ginny's question uh, of, whether those feedbacks can explain also variability at much shorter timescales. Um, brief summary, uh, take home message from this really is, if you're looking at an ice stream right now and you think it is in a steady state, well, actually, even if the mean climate does not change, this ice stream can experience big oscillations and, and big changes just because there is noise in the forcing in the climate forcing. And so it doesn't take anything big to push them away. And so this is important because when we model ice sheet evolution, uh, we really would want to be able to say that ice streams remain as close as possible to how we observe them today, except that this tells us that that is not really guaranteed in any circumstance. And so something that warrants further thinking. All right. All right, um, so if this all makes sense, I don't know if there are any questions, please ask them. Uh, I'm happy to take them. Um, if not, then the other, uh, the next big thing and last part of the talk um, is about a different type of dynamic process that is this idea of patterning and self-organization. Um, so I'll just drink a, a sip of water. And then we can uh, jump right into this. So as, as an introduction, like what are we really talking about when I say patterning and symmetry breaking, and which are all terms that come from fluid dynamics and are very um, are, are well known to people who think, think about instability in fluids, but less known in the geophysics. So just to get the, the background straight, here I'm going to show you a movie. This is simulations by Doug Brinkhoff um, and Jesse Johnson, circular eye sheet. Uh, is what you're seeing, you will see a velocity map. Again, blue means slow, orange means, orange, uh, red means fast. Now, the solution, we define a solution of this ice sheet model as symmetric, um, when if you walk along this circular line, like the, the, this white line here, you always encounter the same velocity. So that would be rad radial symmetry. Whereas if you encounter different velocities, then we're saying that we break radial symmetry. And now what, after an initial transient, you'll see that this thing experiences, um, does very funny things that really break the symmetry. There you go. 
and start forming ice stream like features, which eventually set in some form of statistical steady state. There you go. So this is the type of patterns that we're interested in. And really the question that we're asking is, under what conditions this, uh, these patterns form and uh, what are the physics that drive them? And you could think that given that I'm showing you this video, this problem is all done and dusted, but reality is that the video here um, makes some strong assumptions that we can go back to later at the end of the talk. Um, and that essentially tells us that this is a possibility, but it's actually not quite what the way in which reality works. But we can go back to this later. Just keep, keep this in mind that the problem is not solved. Like we did before, show, I showed you evidence from a model. What is, is the evidence from observations that there is any, anything that looks like a pattern on a flat bed? Uh, okay, again, back to the cypole coast on the left, velocity map, blue means low speeds, orange means fast speeds. Now you can count, uh, there are one, uh, so if you start from the bottom, McHale being Shadler, Camby is missing, but we know that there was an ice stream, Willans Mercer. Like there is a pattern there that even to the naked eye is very apparent. Like this, these streams self-organize in space and do so with only very quite weak control from topography underneath. I'm not going to say that the bed is flat there, but it, these things are not flowing into deeply incised troughs. And so to the eye of the fluid dynamics, this really says, this is a fluid flow instability that appears there. And there must be a way to explain that. That is not just that topography organized in such a way that these ice streams look like that. On the right, it's another stunning example. This is um, uh, the bathymetry of the continental shelf off the coast of Iceland. And you can see on the, oh, pardon, on the bottom right, um, along this XX prime section, those are uh, glacially incised troughs that uh, Chris Clark and Matteo Spagnolo interpret as produced by ice streams. If you look at them closely, they have a beautifully regular spacing of about 50 kilometers, which again says, well, what really begs the question, what are the physical processes that can produce such a regular pattern? Um, and, and running a few steps ahead, really the question that comes to mind here is, well, would it be possible that the same exact same processes that cause activation and stagnation in time of this ice stream that we looked at before could produce uh, activation and stagnation in, play, in, in space. In a way, if you look at the cypole coast on the left, you see streams flowing fast and the ridge on their side that is almost stagnant. So would that be at all a possibility? Um, and so instead of having that one single location on the trunk of, of the ice stream goes from fast flowing to stagnant, then you could have that adjacent loca location experience act fast flow and slow flow. And now what, what, we would, what do we need to do to make that happen? Well, we need a process that modulates the strength of the bed like we saw before for activation and stagnation. And if we go and look at the, at the cypole coast, so this is a combination of observational results from Charlie Bentley and then more recent work by Ginny. Um, the important thing that you realize is that first across, um, so you see those uh, on the left figure, I'm sorry, I'm a little in trouble with this virtual uh, in-person thing. So forgive me for not being super precise. But uh, for those of you who are, who are here on the left, uh, left, um, left panel, you see those black thing, things here. Those mark transitions from stream to ice ridge and have been shown to also be a transition from frozen bed in the ridge where the flow is low to thawed bed under the stream where the, the, the flow is fast. And then on the right panel shows again, radar uh, reflectivity of the bed, which is a measure of uh, how much water is there and tell us that, forget about camp for a moment, but in most circumstances, the, the stream is wet and the ridges on their side are, uh, are frozen. And so this is, so going back to the, the question about the melting point temperature of before, like this is a slight variation on what we saw uh, for 
the oscillations in time. Uh, but what is really telling us is that thermal physics uh, and uh, being frozen or being thawed is really what modulates the uh, ability having an ice stream or not having an ice stream. And so it's just a more extreme case of what a plastic bed alone would do is just that we need to account for these thermal aspects uh, to explain the same, but it gives us confidence that really it, we are on the right track. And now what, just to rephrase the question, then what we ask is, well, is it possible that a transition from, a transition from frozen to temperate bed, which would happen in a laterally uniform ice sheet, there are self-reinforcing feedbacks that manifest themselves and that can spontaneously lead to this patterning in such a way that then we have streams that are thawed and ridges that are frozen in between them. And if you want to tackle this question, really what we need to ask, what we need is a recipe in, in the modeling world that allows us to go from frozen to temperate. And so I'm going to spend the next two or three minutes telling you that this is actually not trivial at all. And then we can take it from there and go back to the patterning question. So forgive me for the brief digression, but it's kind of important. And so if we think about right now for a moment about how do we go from frozen to temperate in an ice sheet, like here we have again our ice sheet flow line. Um, we have, if we start from an ice divide on the left, ice divides tend to be cold because there is strong advection downwards. And then as you progress along your flow line, you warm the bed up uh, due to glacial dissipation till to some point you get to the melting point. And that is what is marked in red on the right. And now if you look at the ice mechanical problem, you say, well, I have basal no slip uh, where the ice is frozen and I have basal sliding where the ice, uh, the ice bed contact is at the melting point. And I can think of this transition from frozen to temperate as just splicing together these two modes of motion which is what most ice sheet models do, except for the fact that this actually is a really bad idea. Like Andrew Fowler and Ed Bueller had suggested that this is so in a specific type of model, but reality is that it is so all the times and we really should not be doing this. And to understand why, we just need to look a little bit more closely into what happens at this transition point if we assume uh, that this hard switch, like as I like to call it, uh, is really what happens. Now, if we zoom in there, now what we get is that we can approximate our ice sheet uh, as an ice slab, which is what I am showing you here. Uh, so y-axis is the, the depth of the ice column. So one is the ice surface, zero is the, um, is the bed. Ice flows from left to right. Uh, and uh, on the left side, like where you see blue uh, down here, for negative axis, uh, the ice is uh, the ice bed contact is frozen and there is no sliding. And on the right, we are allowing slid sliding and keeping the bed at the melting point. And the the shading is the velocity field. This is a full Stokes model for those of you for uh, to whom this means something. And the gray curves are streamlined. So if I am a particle of ice, I'm sitting on one of these these lines and that is where the flow brings me, right? And so what, what you want to look at is what happens around zero, which is where you start to slide. You see that the streamlines converge very steeply towards the bed. That would be all fine. Mechanically, it works perfectly. Energetically, that is a big problem because what we're doing along with this strong advection downward is bringing cold ice towards the bed and producing a heat flux that is so large that actually would, means that the bed would want to refreeze. So really this solution is not a solution energetically. And whenever we're assuming that we can just splice together basal no slip and basal sliding, we are violating energy conservation, which is a big problem. And most ice sheet models actually do this. Now, what is the alternative to that? Well, again, Andrew Fowler comes to the rescue um, and he proposed back in the seventies with, with Larson, um, that a completely different process uh, could occur. And um, so he realized that of this issue, um, not of the energy conservation issue, but of this issue of flow lines. And he proposed that perhaps based on observation, it was possible that ice sheets, um, this transition from frozen to temperate would uh, occur differently. Um, and, and if we took into account the role of pre-melting, which 
essentially leads to a form of temperature dependent sliding such that the ice sheet starts sliding far below the melting point. Um, and so the, the interesting thing of that idea is that it gives rise to a completely different structure of the ice sheet where on the left, uh, you have your cold, cold, you're far below the melting point and you have the cold regime we observed before. And on the right, we have the temperate regime, same idea, but in between the two, there is this subtemperate region where temperature is slightly below the melting point, but we also slide. Um, and that can be sustained um, if we allow for this pre-melting. Now the question is, well, does this resolve the energetic issue that we saw before? Didn't know. Uh, so what I did was to couple this new, these boundary conditions that he proposed to an ice flow model and see if I could compute solutions, which is what I'm showing you here. Now the two columns are different parameter regimes. So let's focus on the left column for the time being. And uh, upper panel is the velocity, horizontal velocity, lower panel is the temperature, and the uh, dotted lines mark the extent of the subtemperate region in between these flow lines. And what we see is that we can compute happily steady state solutions of an ice sheet flow line that do not freeze. So this seems to work. Great. And so it doesn't refreeze anymore. And the reason why it doesn't do that is that in this subtemperate region, the um, really what the ice sheet does is it tries to keep the basal energy budget in balance. And so the sliding velocity that now depends on temperature increases only as much as it can be balanced by conductive cooling towards the surface. And so we don't have any more this issue of very large uh, conductive fluxes that would co cause refreezing before. So, okay, we have a possible solution. So now what do we do with this? Well, go back to the question that we had before. We can go from a flow line to a 3D model and say, well, if we start from upstream from an ice sheet that is laterally symmetric and uniform and gradually warms up as we move along in X. Now, is there any feedbacks that happen that can produce a pattern in the slide in the velocity field that look like one of our ice streams? Okay, uh, forget about the math that is on this slide. And so to, to, to do this, well, we go back to this solution that I had that I showed you before, make it three-dimensional, add a little bit of noise, but really low amplitude noise in the friction coefficient and integrate in X and see what the solution looks like. All right, this is the cool part. Now, what I'm showing you here is a top view. So we're looking at our ice sheet strip from above. The Y axis is the transverse direction. The X axis is the along flow direction. Just bear in mind, these are all scaled. So the y-axis is scaled with the ice thickness. So if, if an ice thickness is one kilometer, this strip is 15 kilometers in the, uh, on the y-axis and, um, and the x-axis instead is scaled with the length of the ice sheet. So if the length of the ice sheet is hundred kilometers, this is 2000 kilometers on the x-axis, all right? And so what we're seeing is in color is the temperature of the ice bed contact. Uh, where blue, dark blue means cold and white means the melting point. And uh, black curves are isotherms and uh, gray curves are streamlines of uh, in the basal plane. So again, trajectory of particles along the basal plane. And what you really want to see here is that as you go from left to right, zero is the ice divide the ice bed contact warms up gradually. And then at some point here around one X equal 1.4, you have that lateral symmetry breaks and the flow converges to something in the center. And you have this blob in the center line, which is much warmer than the rest. Now, if you add to that, that velocity increases as with temperature, this, you can see that this is really an ice stream, as in you would have faster velocities in the center line and slower velocities on the sides. And the thing that you really want to see here is that this magenta line is the melting point and the symmetry breaking happens upstream of the melting point. And so it's really about feedbacks of this subtemperate region. Uh, and so this is really the instability we were after. And what we're saying is, well, this thing can actually make an ice stream. What are the processes that produce this instability? Very briefly, we have a positive feedback. So uh, look just at the top panel for, for now. 
We have a positive feedback such that if we make the temperature of the bed a little warmer, sliding wants to be faster due to this temperature dependent friction. And that means that we're making more frictional heating along the bed, which wants to make the bed even warmer. So that is the positive part of the feedback. The negative part of the feedback is instead that as we accelerate along flow, then we have to, we draw a flow, a transverse flow from the sides. Uh, like we have to fill in the gap almost, right? And that transverse flow causes strong advective cooling uh, on the bed and that would want to lower temperature and slow down the flow. Now, when the positive feedback dominates, we have that the instability occurs. And now the, the upper panel is a little deceiving in that because um, you see only the instability showing up at big axis like 1.5, but instead uh, there is a place where this threshold between positive and negative is um, like positive exceeds negative, which is this black, line, black vertical line in the lower panel. And from there onward, if you look at the uh, variance of this bed temperature solution, you see that growing as exponentially as the theory would predict. And so really you see this instability building up um, and, uh, and then eventually producing a stream. All right, um, a couple more things um, before we get to the end of the talk. I'm now zooming in uh, in the onset region, same picture as before. Uh, upper panel is exactly the same, uh, well, actually lower panel is exactly the same thing, uh, temperature. Upper panel is the velocity. Um, so along flow velocity. And so now you really see that there is also this pattern in the velocity where you have uh, faster speeds at the center line, slower speeds on the sides where the bed is colder. Then we're also modeling drainage here, um, which you see as water pressure basically with these dotted lines in the lower panel. But in this left column, it doesn't, drainage doesn't feed back into the sliding. And so it, that gives rise to this bit of a weird shape for an ice cream, which is a little wide and not really so well defined. If we implement a different friction law that allows, that has also a coupling between water pressure and uh, sliding. And so that's exactly the same thing as we had for the oscillating ice cream before. This is the pattern that we get on the right. Uh, so much narrower ice stream, uh, again, here at the center line, ice ridges on the side that almost don't move. So the axial velocity is zero and that are, are extremely cold compared to, to everything else in the ice sheet. And so this is really the cool thing of this model that is it produces this structure of ridges and frozen ridges and towed streams that we were not able to get before and that arises spontaneously out of this instability. Last few things. Well, the, the, I just show you bed maps, but actually this model is much cooler than that. It can do 3D here. The bed map is the same as you saw before, but now I'm showing you also the cross sections. And the, the interesting thing are these streamlines in the cross sections that you see in gray. And what you see is that as you go along the stream, it really, the, the acceleration along the stream really draws ice from the side it deforms the ice surface and it produces this um, ridges, higher ridges on the side. If you look at the last cross section on, on the right and lower surface elevation in the center, which is really diagnostic of what real ice streams look like. And very last, the, the other interesting thing that we do is to model the formation and evolution of shear margins. That is the thing that divides the center like the ice stream from the stagnant uh, ridges on the sides. Now, uh, here on the right, I am showing uh, cross sections at B and D. And uh, upper panel is the acceleration along, uh, along stream. And what you wanted to see on, in B1 is that the, the, the places where the, the flow, the previously uniform flow slow downs uh, and, and forms the ridge have this very funny pattern of streamlines where the ice has to almost make a bump, go up and then converge further down. Uh, so for those of you who are here, that thing up there is what I'm talking about. You see the streamlines go up and then go down. That is very funny. There is no other model that produces that, but there are observations like Nick Holshu observed this uh, at Nijis in Greenland. And uh, rheology has been uh, 
proposed as a mechanism to explain that, but it could also be as simple as actually the pattern of flow slowing down that produces that bump. Other thing that is interesting, um, second row, I'm showing temperature and in white is uh, contours of strain heating. So where does the stream make heat? Like second row on the right, uh, on the cross section on the right. If you look at D2, it's very interesting because the fact that the, the shear margins are now subtemperate and not fully frozen, and so there is some sliding in there, means that most of the heating is moved towards the interior of the stream, uh, whereas being on the outside of the stream. And uh, um, that interior, uh, th that heating is what produces temperate ice that is something that can be observed. And now, I don't know, I was talking to Dusty Schroeder the other day asking, well, what do you guys observe? Is temperate ice outside or inside of the stream? Because this could be something that really allows us to tell from nature if this is the process that really we're observing. And I don't have the answer for that. Very last bottom slide, uh, bottom panel. Look again at D1. Uh, there are lots of curves in here, but look at the, uh, the black curve that is high up on top of everything. That is a proxy for water pressure. The other thing that is, is funny about this model is that this, the way in which heat is advected inside the stream means that we have these two maxima in water pressure, one here. Uh, so again, this thing is what I'm looking at, one and two. And those two places are places that are funny because um, the velocity increases and then you have that you're inverting the relation between velocity and, and, and water pressure. And that would be a place that if your model allowed to do so, uh, where you could form a channel in the subglacial drainage system. Now, my model doesn't allow us to do that right now, but it's something that I'm working on. This is something that has been proposed as an explanation for rapid migration of shear margins in the past, but we have never been able to produce channelization within a stream dynamically. But if we account for this type of processes, this is something we could possibly predict in a dynamic way. And so it's in the realm of possibilities. So I'm going running out of time. Um, I just want to close with what is still open about this patterning prob problem. The, the key finding that, that we have is that this subtemperate sliding give, gives rise to a pattern that has nothing to do, um, or actually has a lot to do with what we observe in reality in a way that we were not able to do before. There is one thing that is very much open. The results that I showed you today assume that our ice sheet is in a steady state. There is a big open question that is, what are, are these patterns stable over time? We have all the reasons to believe that they are not, but this is certainly one piece of the story. Um, work that I'm doing though tells us that to get at the unsteady behavior of these three-dimensional patterns, we need three-dimensional Stokes model that also resolve this subtemperate sliding, which is something that technically does not exist today. So this is something that I'm working on with Thomas Zwinger and the Elmer Ice people to try and develop. The other thing that is open and big is, well, the, foundations, the foundation of this is subtemperate sliding, but yes, we have observed subtemperate sliding a few times, but like a handful of times we would really need to do a better job at characterizing this observationally, which can and should be done. Very last, um, well, I hope that it's now clear that this problem of streaming is a really complicated one, and, but also an extraordinarily fascinating one. I'm not sure that I have convinced you that this is actually a problem that as a community, we really need to solve. And so I want to close with this rationale that is, well, just keep this in mind if you, uh, if you bring something home from this talk. The so ice streams account for really a large part of the ice sheet discharge to the ocean in Antarctica today. We know that these ice streams have dynamics. They can switch on and off. They can appear spontaneously. Um, we don't know very well how climate affects these dynamics. But what we do know is that right now, we, the, the, the models, the best estimates that we have of uh, mass loss from ice, for, from ice sheets for the next 100 years, rely, need to rely on the assumption that ice streams remain as they are today. And, and, and yet we don't know that we can do that. And really we, we haven't answered the key question of how much do these dynamics affect the mass balance of an ice sheet? Maybe not at all, maybe a lot. But so 
if this is something that is interesting to you that you uh, are thinking about that you have observations that we can do something with please reach out and uh, I, I think this is a problem that really needs to be solved and with this I'd like to thank you and sorry for taking longer than the time that was given to me. Um, yeah, so we are at time, but we've probably got time. Well, we probably could have a quick question. Um, and there are additional slots to sign up this afternoon if you want to talk to Eloisa. And I'm uh, happy to take as many questions as there are. I am in no rush. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I think graduate students are going to lunch, I think, uh, in half an hour, so sometime. So any questions from the room? Yes. Oh, okay. Can I? So uh, sub-temperate sliding sounds like analogous to me, like ice skating, where like you don't actually have melting, but the ice is still slippery. Is, is that the right way to think about it? Or is it kind of a different fundamental process? So I think, uh, okay, let me premise that I cannot answer with 100% certainty, but uh, because this, 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 the, the, the microscopic foundation of friction at solid, uh, so at the interface between two different materials is actually something tricky that I am no expert on. But um, uh, in a way, yes, I am not sure that with ice skating, you actually don't produce a, like you don't actually have a positive melt rate. Uh, I cannot tell you that for sure. The interesting thing about what an ice sheet does when you have this subtemperate sliding is that the melt rate is approximately zero, but you still have uh, a microscopic film of water. And so in, in some way, probably, yes, I don't know. I cannot tell you if the analogy holds, but qualitatively, yes. Um, if that answers your question. Yeah, it just reminded me of some reading I was doing on like quasi liquid layers and stuff like that. And I just was wondering if it was similar. So I know that was really helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Great talk. Um, it's fascinating to see how some condition could change the flow configuration of the ice stream ice sheet. I'm just wondering, have we seen such behavior or re records um, from observations, say, in glacial stratigraphy over certain regions? So uh, when it comes specifically about subtemperate sliding or the type of physics that are implicated in this transition from frozen to temperate bed, the answer is yes. So this is a line of work that I'm pursuing with Dusty Schroeder. Like I'm not a radar person myself, but um, one question that, that I was interested in and that we tried to tackle together was, well, can you, so we have these two hypotheses for how you start sliding in an ice sheet and that is really consequential for what type of dynamics you get out of it. So if I go and look at glacial stratigraphy, can I use that to discriminate between um, a hard switch where I start sliding just at the melting point or a distributed onset region where I start sliding below the melting point. And the answer is that you can rule out a, uh, a hard switch. So like we've been looking at um, Institute Ice Stream, Weddell Sea Sector, um, and, uh, the, and we've been looking for a pattern of glacial deformation that is characteristic of, would be characteristic of this hard switch and so we know that a transition from no slip to sliding happens there, but we see nothing in glacial deformation that resembles that. So I'm confident that we can rule that out. What I cannot do though, is to prove that actually subtemperate sliding is what happens. Like I can see, I can say that it's compatible, but technically speaking, I cannot prove that that is the case. But yes, stratigraphy is very helpful because especially because when, when you would have this abrupt onset, you would have very localized down draw of uh, layers that is really super diagnostic of something like that. And you wouldn't expect to see basically in any other circumstances. So if you don't find that, you can say, well, certainly sliding doesn't start abruptly, but that's as far as I can go. That looks like uh, Mark Hess has um, a question online. Hey, yeah, great talk, awesome. I was curious, maybe keeping back to these 2D cross sections for your two and a half D, yeah. 
what's what's happening so the gray lines are streamlines right yes so what's happening in the center it seems like there's what's a mass happening? thing yeah so the center well uh, it's really the place where so think of this in 3d you are um, the flow that comes out of the page is accelerating at the center line and so all the lateral streamlines are drawn toward the center and now if you look at the cross section on the left like b1 that is perfectly the center you're actually the the, the margins are not widening much there as you move further downstream, you have that the point of convergence can move a little bit from the center to one side or the other side, because like the margins of the stream, so the, the, the grid point that you are towing laterally um, widens the stream. And so it shifts the streamlines one side or the other. And that is a discrete effect that just happens because you are discreetly widening the stream. But really physically what you're doing is the same in both cases where you have this stretching along means converging from the sides and downward. And so that is also what, so sorry, go ahead. No, I guess I'm just trying to, you know, your figure 1B, let's say on the, on the left, right? And then the, well, actually I called both 1B, but I'm just like the top view where the, the streamline seem to go the way I interpret them, you know, whatever, right to left, and but are not converging all to the middle. And then the cross section, which I presume is a cross section perpendicular to. So the figure yes. on the left is a top view, right? And it seems the streamlines just go sort of. Yeah, but right. it's different streamlines. That is maybe the, the confusing thing. Uh, so what you're seeing in the bed maps is streamlines of ice particles that lie on the bed, all right? So you're seeing the uh, ice sheet bed velocity field, whereas on the cross section, you're seeing the, you're cutting a slice through your ice stream. Uh, and so it's actually two different velocity fields um, that are coupled only through mass conservation. So you have, a sh so maybe this requires a little bit of uh, explanation of what the model is like, because you have this full stocks flow in the transverse, but it's a shallow ice flow in the along flow direction. So if we go back to this slide here, um, this is really what you should be looking at to understand this. So the transverse velocity field V perpendicular um, obeys the second equation, which is, it's a Stokes flow. But the along flow velocities, which is U, um, it, you have the uh, divergence of the transfer of the, of you in the transverse plane, which balances a hydrostatic pressure term along. So the two things are actually coupled only through basically this term here uh, in a UX in mass conservation, um, where basically you say the, uh, it's almost like a non-compressible flow, a, a compressible flow where compressibility comes seen through UX there. So the two things are not fully coupled in this sense is it's a funny model. It's an asymptotically reduced model where uh, X is shallow and Y and Z is Stokes. Okay, cool, thanks. Did I answer your question at all? Um, pa partially, no. I need to think about your answer. <laughs> so I probably did, but I may not have understood it. But I, I mean, I'm starting to see how, how the two go together. Yeah, well, we can talk more about it later, probably. <laughs> uh, any more questions? I think I'll have one more, one question. Um, does fabric matter? In what regard? Uh, in, in shaping ice streams. Um, the Surely it does. Um, I would argue that it doesn't matter in initiating ice streams. Um, what I would be curious to know is as we get more and more detailed observations of what the margins look like, is how much of the structure in the margins can be ascribed simply to getting right the, the initiation of the margin or is about fabric. And this, I don't know. I would expect that the amount of heat that you dissipate in the margins certainly is affected by rheology and fabric and therefore eventually the rate at which you widen your stream as you go downstream, that is a place where all these things come in. 
um, the, the really interesting question, I guess, is how does reorganization of grains affect heat production and therefore meltwater production eventually? That could be really important for the stream itself. Not something that I can easily do right now, but something that one could test also against observation. So that's how I see it. Thank you. And with that, unless we've got any other questions online. I, um, I have a question. So uh, by including this um, um, ice dynamics, uh, so what uh, impacts would it have on our current climate projections or in the GCM results? Would it be huge for um, locally or would it be also huge for the tropics? I have to ask you to repeat the last part of the question because I couldn't hear it all. So, yeah. So uh, my question is, uh, um, um, so how large would the would be would the impact be? Like, would would it only have a local impact, or would it also have a huge impact globally or to well, other regions? Yeah, that that is precisely the thing that. I cannot answer right now, uh, but is a, it's really the motivation for me for doing this work. And uh, what you need to answer that question um, is to have all the pieces in an ice sheet model that you can run for all of Antarctica for a long time. And we're not there yet. Just uh, like this work that I've been doing says, we need models of a complexity, of a physical complexity that we cannot afford at the scale of a whole ice sheet. We need to resolve the physics of boundary layers at meter scale. No way you can do that in an ice sheet model today. Um, I don't know that I have an expectation about whether these dynamics uh, can change the mass balance of an ice sheet. Well, I kind of think that they can. So if you think of how the, the Paleolaurentide ice sheet, the glaciated, and the fact that ice streams showed up everywhere in this ice sheet. And then after that, the ice sheet collapsed, then there would be reason to believe that they matter. But frankly, as a scientist, I cannot tell you that they do. I think that this is really though the question that we need to answer. It can be one way or the other, but we kind of need to know. And like, if you draw an analogy to atmospheric sciences, for instance, so atmospheric scientists figured out that they can neglect baroclinic instabilities in the atmosphere because they don't change the global circulation pattern. But like, this is kind of the same thing. We haven't figured that ice stream dynamics do not do or do not affect the mass balance of the ice sheet and how much. So um, we really need to get there, but we're not there yet. So I cannot answer. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm just curious whether there, there no, have it, been some studies carried out or not on this. Okay, uh, so what you can look at, so Nick Gollage's work that I, I, um, I, I showed at the beginning, like those simulation, hold on, I can go back to that. That would be the one thing that gets close to your question. Um, there we go, hold on. Here, this, this is a paper that you can look at. Um, and in a way, he, he has an approximated version of ice streams. Do these dynamics correspond to reality? Well, I wouldn't bet on that. They look like they're real, but this ice sheet slides almost everywhere. Does it matter? Do, do dynamics matter? Well, it seems that they're really important to getting West Antarctica completely deglaciated. Uh, and so you see that this thing shrinks and you'll, okay, there you go. The shrinks and shrinks and shrinks even more. Is this real? I'm not going to say yes or no, um, but this is probably as close as it gets to the question that you're asking. Then there is a lot of idealized work in circular geometries, um, ice mint experiments, uh, the ice mint in intercomparison exercise, which I pulled um, Richard Kalov's paper from uh, also at the beginning would be another place, but that hasn't, been extended to a real ice sheet. 
So this is probably as close as it gets, really, I would say. Yeah. Not for projections, though, like into the future, not that I know of. OK, yeah, thank you. You're very welcome. Sorry, this thing is a little addictive. There questions? <laughs> Well, I think with that, um, thanks again. That was a really great talk. So, yeah. Thank you for having me.